Let us understand the role or the job of a cloud architect or a solution architect with a quick example. Let's say that you have approached a cloud architect or a solution architect to design a solution for your WordPress website. You want your WordPress website to be hosted on AWS and you have approached a cloud architect to design a solution for the same. Now, if you were to host that WordPress website on a typical shared server uh, from a hosting provider, things are pretty straightforward. You just deploy the files and your website would be up and running. However, when you deploy it on AWS Cloud, things will get a bit complicated depending on your requirements. Now, this architecture is picked up from the official AWS website, and this will show you how a typical WordPress website can be deployed. And this is the kind of solution you can expect from a solution architect to deploy your WordPress website. Now, obviously, I'm not going to go deep into any of these because I assume that you're still a beginner. So I'll try my best to keep things very simple for the time being. So first of all, we have the users who would access the website from the web. And once they send the request, the request would land on AWS Route 53. Why is this required? Well, out of many things that Route 53 does, it also acts as a domain name system. Essentially, what that means is it will translate the domain names into IP addresses to direct the traffic to your website. For example, let's say that the website is hosted on AWS EC2 instance or a virtual machine, and you want to map a domain name like, say, abc.com to your website. You can use Route 53 to register the domain name and route all the traffic from the internet to your ECT instance. What's the advantage of it? User doesn't have to enter the IP address of the server in order to access the WordPress website. We already know that it's really hard to remember the IP address. So using Route 53 as a domain name system, users would enter something like abc.com that they can easily remember. And internally, Route 53 will do the job of translating it into equivalent IP address where the website is hosted. Next, we have the cloud front, Amazon cloud front. Now, why is this required? Well, whenever the request comes from the user, it typically has to take multiple network hops before it reaches the actual server. That's clearly a problem because let's say that the user is sending requests from India and let's say that the server is residing in the United States. Then the request has to travel half the world, actually more than that in order to serve the request to the user, which might result in a lot of latency. So what Amazon CloudFront does is, it is essentially a content delivery service that sort of replicates the data stored in AWS to other edge locations. You can think of edge location as simply physical servers residing on multiple regions or multiple locations across the globe. And all the static content would be replicated or cached in edge locations so that whenever a user requests for a particular resource, say an image or a video, then instead of sending the request all the way to the server, that content would be served from the edge location that is closest proximity from where the request is coming from. So what's the advantage of it? This accelerates the static website content delivery and improves the delivery of on-demand or live stream video, for instance. This is not a compulsory thing to have, but if you have CloudFront, it's going to improve the latency and users will have better experience with your website. But where does the content come from in order for the CloudFront to replicate all that content across multiple edge locations? Well, it's going to pick from something like S3 bucket, which will typically store the static files like images, videos, HTML, CSS, JavaScript, etc. Next, we have the internet gateway. Now, why is this needed? Everything that is encapsulated within this green box is a virtual private cloud. All the resources inside the virtual private cloud cannot access anything outside world and vice versa. Anything from outside world cannot access anything inside the virtual private cloud. However, Internet Gateway makes it possible for inbound and outbound communication. Basically, Internet Gateway will enable the resources in a virtual private cloud to access the Internet making it possible to connect to public endpoints such as S3, for instance. If you notice, S3 is not inside the virtual private cloud. And so S3 can actually be accessed over the browser by the user. In order for anything inside the virtual private cloud to access 
resources outside the virtual private cloud, like S3, for instance, they can do it only through Internet Gateway, and that's why we have Internet Gateway. And then we have the load balance, as the name suggests, it will help us balance the load. For example, let's say you have multiple instances. Instead of sending all the traffic to one single instance and overloading it, the load balancer will actually balance the load by distributing the traffic across multiple instances. And we also have multiple availability zones. So whatever is encapsulated inside this blue box, we actually have a couple of them, or availability zones. Whatever you see in one availability zone, you're going to see exact replica of them in another availability zone. Now, why do we have multiple availability zones? Well, if for some reason, one availability zone were to go down, then you have other availability zone for business continuity and customers or your end users will not face any downtime. Next, we have subnets. We have public subnet as well as the private subnet. Well, what's the difference between these two? Public subnets are subnets that are directly accessible from the internet through the internet gateway. They have a route to the internet through an internet gateway which enables resources within the subnet to communicate with the internet or the outside world. The private subnet on the other hand are not directly accessible from the internet. They do not have a route to the internet through an internet gateway. Instead, they would rely on other resources in virtual private cloud such as NAT gateway or VPN connections to access the internet. While the internet gateway or sometimes called as IGW allows both inbound and outbound access to the internet the NAT gateway only allows outbound access. That means resources inside the private subnet can access the outside world, but not the vice versa. While the internet gateway allows the instances with public IPs to access the internet, NAT gateway allows instances with private IPs to access the internet. So everything inside the private subnet would have private IPs. Everything inside the public subnet would have public IP addresses. Now, obviously, we don't want to go too deep. But as a solution architect, when you're designing an AWS infrastructure, it is very important to consider security and accessibility requirements. So by using the combination of public and private subnets within your virtual private cloud, you can create a secure and scalable network architecture that meets your business needs. And then we have the virtual server itself, where you will install the entire software stack, Linux, PHP, etc., and host your website. And obviously, your WordPress website might be needing a database. It does need a database. And that's where Amazon Aurora database would come into picture, which will allow you to host the MySQL database that WordPress uses. And then you also have Elastic Cache for Memcached, which is essentially a caching mechanism which will store the frequently requested data so that if you already have the data cached, then you can directly retrieve it from the cache rather than querying the database. And then we have EFS mount storage. EFS stands for Elastic File Storage. Now, I don't want to go deep and confuse you further, but essentially the Elastic File Storage would provide a scalable network file storage, which is more secure and also faster compared to say S3. And the EFS mount target would sort of act like a medium between your virtual server and the EFS. Essentially, your virtual server would be able to access the contents of EFS through EFS mount target. We also have certain resources under auto scaling. So as the demand increases, you want to increase the resources. If, for example, let's say traffic has increased, maybe you're running sales or something, then you can expect huge inflow of traffic. And so all the resources or virtual instances would be scaling up accordingly. And when the traffic decreases, it would automatically scale down the resources as well. Not to confuse further, but we also have Bastion host, which can be used to provide access to the private network from external network. This is different from the NAT gateway. For example, in order to log into EC2 instance within the virtual private cloud, then we might need this Bastion host. 
On the other hand, NAT gateways used to allow resources within the virtual private cloud to access the internet while still maintaining the security of not exposing their private IP addresses to the public internet. Now, obviously we don't want to go deep. This is just a high level overview of what this architecture is about. And this is a kind of solution you can expect from a solution architect when you approach them to deploy your WordPress website. This is still relatively a very simple architecture depending on your business needs and depending on the scale of the application that you want to deploy on AWS, the architecture would get more complex. But I hope that this sort of given you an idea of what sort of job a solution architect or a cloud architect does. Their job is not just to deploy your application, but they need to make sure it is more resilient, fault tolerant, scalable, secure, and a lot of other such factors. Hope it makes sense. If you like this video, you should also check out my other video which is on the same topic. Link to that video is in the description below. Make sure you watch it. I've also kept some useful resources on this topic. Again, you're going to find them all in the description below. But before you leave, do like and subscribe. The current subscriber count of this channel is embarrassingly low. And this channel is really struggling to take off despite putting a lot of effort to create good content. It only takes a couple of seconds for you to like and subscribe. I don't really expect you to share this video because I understand it's a difficult task to do but if you do it as well it helps this channel and keeps us motivated to bring you more quality content like this. I'll see you in my next video. Have a great day ahead.